Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. Ward off uh, future deaths, but um, those that are vaccinated and boosted uh, at least have a better chance of not dying other than just getting sick, which is a big, a big help. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, anyone else can you please, so that we can start? And I think that. the health practice. What is kind of scary though is that uh, people no, are acting you you? as though the vaccine no. uh, that the, the, the virus is gone. Mm -hmm. What you say is very true, but our behavior is not like that. Our and behavior is like the pandemic is over and uh, we don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So, and that's that's what is more deadly than anything else, perhaps. Can everyone else go on mute so we can get started? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, today we're, we're we're blessed to have Dr. Katrina Chinaline, who uh, I've been acquainted with for quite some time now. We <laughs> we go back to many bus rides and other things, but she's been an excellent student. Actually, she's, I guess you finished ten years ago, right? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, she's uh, one of the most outstanding ophthalmologists uh, there is. Uh, she works along with Leslie Jones at uh, Howard University. She's been an, a stellar student and a tremendous resident and an outstanding faculty member. And so I take great pride and pleasure in introducing you to Dr. Katrina Chinaloy, who's been the mainstay for the Department of Ophthalmology since she joined them. Awesome. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now. I have a presentation for you all. Um, Dr. Callender asked me to talk to you today about eye disease, specifically eye disease that comes as we age. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, he already went over my name and title. I'm definitely happy to be here. Um, I've been at Howard since medical school through residency and now as faculty. Um, I have no financial disclosures. Um, today, I'm briefly just going to go over what the normal anatomy of the eye is so that we can understand some of the pathologies that I'm going to go through. I'm going to discuss some common causes of low vision and blindness, some eye findings that we can see in some common um, disease processes such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and then I'm just going to talk about a few other eye problems that um, develop as we age. And then lastly, I'm just going to discuss some tips that you can take home to maintain eye health. So normal eye anatomy, this is what um, I'm going to be talking about. So if I mention different parts of the eyes, um, the front of the eye is the cornea. Um, and then right behind that is a space of fluid and then the iris. This is the colored part of your eye. Um, so some people have brown iris, some people have blue iris, but that's what they're referring to usually when they talk about color of the eye. Behind that is the lens. So we're gonna spend a good time talking about the lens today. Um, and then a whole cavity filled with some jelly. And then the back layer of the eye is called the retina. And also at the back of the eye is the nerve. So as I go through that, I'll kind of mention some of these things, but I wanted to kind of give you a visual of what those different parts are and where they are. And when I look inside a patient's eye, this is what I see. So this is the same structures, but this is the optic nerve, some of the blood vessels that come off. And then this orangish area is the retina or this back layer of the eye. So to start, I just wanted to talk about some common causes of low vision and blindness in the United States, because most of these increase as we age. The most common causes of blindness in the United States include refractive errors, age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, cataract, glaucoma, and diabetic retinopathy. And I'm gonna just dive into each of these in a little bit more detail. So refractive error is very common. Anyone in this group that's wearing glasses um, on the screen now, including myself, you have a refractive error. So a refractive error is just a way of saying that when light comes in through the eye, it doesn't fall exactly on the retina. Um, and luckily, most of these are easily corrected. Um, some common ones include myopia, when the light falls in front of the retina. Hyperopia is when the light falls behind the retina. 
presbyopia is what develops usually around age 40 um, when the lens of the eye is not able to focus up close anymore um, and you start to need a little bit of assistance for that. That's when you start to need bifocals, for example. And then astigmatism is another thing that we can correct. But all of these things can luckily be corrected with lenses. So we can put the lenses in front of the eye, that's the glasses or contacts that you wear, and that helps the light to fall exactly where it needs to on the retina to see clearly. Um, as long as there's no other problems with the eye, that's a simple way that we can improve vision in people of all ages. Um, when patients come to me, they sometimes have specific things that they report that they're noticing in their vision. And based on that, I can get an idea of what I might um, want to look out for on their exam. For example, if they talk about something in the middle of their vision or distortion, I'm gonna think of one thing and I'm gonna kind of go through these. Um, if they talk about just like a general blur, decrease, decrease contrast sensitivity, increased glare from bright light, I'm gonna be thinking about something different. If they talk about some red spots or like patchy vision loss, I'm gonna be thinking something different. And if they talk about sort of decreased peripheral vision, for example, if they're driving and they feel like their blind spot on the sides is enlarging, I'm gonna be thinking about something different. So just what um, the patients come into, come into me telling me about can already kind of give me an idea of what to look for. And you may have experienced some of these specific um, things or noticed some of these specific things. So as we go through this, um, I hope this information is helpful for you. Um, so if you have that first picture, this central vision loss, um, what I'm going to be thinking of is age-related macular degeneration. So this is in the center part of the eye, the main sightseeing part of the eye. Um, it affects um, nearly 2 million Americans over 40 years old. It's a leading cause of permanent impairment of reading and fine or up close vision among people age 65 and older. So this is more common as we get older. There are a couple different types. The uh, more common type is called dry AMD or dry macular degeneration. It's caused by drusen, which are these yellow spots that I see when I look at the back of your eye um, that are deposited on the middle part of the eye. Um, unfortunately, there's no treatment for the dry form. We just try to slow it down in terms of progression. Um, you can take a multivitamin to support the health of the eye to try and slow that down long term. But once it's there, there's nothing that we can do to treat this. Um, there is another form called wet AMD. In this form, there are blood vessels that leak proteins and other fluid around the deposits. And one thing that you might notice when you have this type of um, macular degeneration is things that are supposed to look straight look wavy instead. For example, door frames or telephone poles, um, things that are supposed to be like straight up and down or horizontal um, start to look either crooked, wavy, or spots of them are missing. So if you notice anything like that, you should definitely come in right away because suspicion for wet macular degeneration is high. Um, luckily, there is a way to treat this. Um, it is by doing medicine directly to the eye. So you may know some people or even have experienced yourself um, getting this medicine to the eye. It is an injection that goes right into the eye and that helps to decrease the leakiness of the blood vessels um, as well as the bleeding around them. Another common cause of blindness, cataract. So this is a very, very common cause of blindness. Um, over 20 million Americans age 40 years and older have cataract in one or both eyes. Many people that have cataract in the United States are able to treat that and have them removed um, operatively. So this is just a photo of a patient that's dilated. So you can see here, normally the middle of the pupil should be black because light goes through and it goes to the back of the eye, that whole cavity and space that I showed earlier earlier. Um, when the lens, which is right behind the iris, is cloudy, it can appear whitish, it can appear brownish. Um, so when you're dilated, instead of light being able to get through to the back, you have this appearance. So this is a big cataract. Obviously, um, there are stages of cataract, so it might not appear this dramatic if you um, look at someone or if you yourself look in the mirror, but um, cataract is the most common uh, cataract surgery is the most common outpatient procedure, um, outpatient surgery done in the United States. And it's also the most common surgery that we do here at Howard as well. So um, definitely 
um, something that you yourself may have been diagnosed with or treated for, or that you, a friend might have, or a family member, because this is very, very common um, and luckily treatable with the surgical techniques that we have. So this is a reversible cause of low vision or blindness. Um, in terms of potential um, ways to slow down cataract development, there is some potential benefit um, identified from wearing sunglasses. Um, if you're smoking, stopping smoking can also help. Um, if you don't smoke, don't start. Um, and then good nutrition. So the process of cataract development is primarily an oxidation um, of the lens of the eye. So anything that's high in antioxidants is gonna help you kind of prolong the health of your eyes and slow down this cataract development. So eating green leafy vegetables, usually fruits and berries and vegetables that are really colorful are naturally very high in those antioxidants. So berries are a great option. Um, tomato, beets, all of those things are really good, um, not just for the eyes, but just for overall health and slowing down oxidation, which is the one of the main causes of aging of our bodies. Um, and then as I already mentioned, um, we do treat these definitively with surgery when they become um, visually significant, meaning they're impacting your day-to-day -day activities, um, impacting your ability to do the things you want to do, such as drive um, or function independently. And this specific surgery is usually um, done just under light anesthesia, and it's an in and out procedure, meaning you come and go home the same day. Um, another cause of low vision that affects us, especially as we get older, is called glaucoma. So you may have also heard of this one. Um, there are different types of glaucoma. Um, open angle and closed angle are the two main ways that we categorize um, glaucoma. So normally fluid is made in the eye and drains off, um, but when you have a blockage of the way that fluid can normally flow, that's called closed angle glaucoma. In open angle glaucoma, there's no blockage of how the fluid flows, but there is an imbalance usually in terms of how much fluid is made and how easily it drains off. So I'm going to go through just a little bit more detail about glaucoma. Um, so in that earlier photo that I showed you with kind of some of the different symptoms that you might experience, the glaucoma one is the one that was um, sort of developing a tunnel vision or decreased peripheral vision. So you can have really good vision and see 2020 on the chart when we examine you or kind of when you're functioning out and about and can still be developing glaucoma because it usually affects your most peripheral vision first, which isn't always obvious. So in the early stages of open angle glaucoma, it can usually be asymptomatic, meaning there's no signs. It doesn't have pain. It doesn't have um, change in vision in terms of decreased vision. Um, so it's really important if you're at risk for glaucoma, and I'll go through some of those risks, to get evaluated to make sure that you're not developing glaucoma because it can be asymptomatic. Um, the other type of glaucoma that I mentioned, the angle closure, um, that if you are going into an acute um, phase of that, that can have symptoms. That can include severe pain, redness, decreased vision, um, or blurred vision, rainbows, halos, headaches, um, and nausea or vomiting. And that nausea or vomiting headache is usually because the pressure in the eye goes up really high, really quickly. Um, that is, those are symptoms with acute angle closure. That's much less common than open angle, but it does have those kind of constellation of symptoms to look out for. Um, if you do experience that, obviously, um, hopefully you can get um, evaluated right away just so we can make sure it's not um, something that's happening to you. Um, in terms of people who are at risk of developing glaucoma, so anyone over age 60 has a higher risk, um, but if you have any family members with glaucoma, if you are of African or Hispanic heritage, um, you are also at risk of de developing open angle glaucoma. Um, if you are of Asian heritage, especially um, Japanese, you're at risk of developing angle closure glaucoma or low tension glaucoma. Um, and then if you have um, identified as having eye, high eye pressure on past eye exams, um, even if you don't have any damage to the nerve, which is the part of the eye that gets damaged 
with glaucoma, you are at risk of developing glaucoma in the future. Um, if you've had any eye injury before, that can affect the drainage system of your eye and predispose you to glaucoma. Um, and then if you have the front of your eye that I showed you, the cornea, if that is thin in the center, that also can affect um, how your risk of developing glaucoma long-term. And then there are some other um, associations that I list here, diabetes, migraines, high blood pressure, or poor but blood circulation have some less strong associations with developing glaucoma. In terms of how we treat glaucoma, again, very common. So you yourself, or you may know someone that has glaucoma, um, but we diagnose it by checking a couple specific things when you come to see us. We measure the pressure in your eye. We look at your eye's drainage system. We look at the nerve in the back of the eye. And then we also check your peripheral vision, because like I said earlier, um, it usually will affect your peripheral vision and you could have actually really good um, vision in the center of your eye. And then we also measure how thick the front of your eye is because that can affect how we interpret the pressure of the eye. So I shown some pictures of the back of the eye already, but this is the nerve of the eye again and the blood vessels coming off. Normally you want to have a nice healthy rim of nerve tissue around. When this middle part, called the cup increases and gets to be almost the size of the rim, that's consistent with glaucoma. So this is something we look at and measure every time we look at the back of the eye, just to see um, if you're suspicious for glaucoma or if you have glaucoma, how that's changing over time. Um, in terms of treatment, the main thing that we can do to treat glaucoma is to lower the pressure in the eyes. Um, and we do this by a couple different ways. So first line treatment is topical medications or eye drops. Um, so these are well studied. They've been around for a long time. Um, so um, there are obviously side effects to any medication. And that's a um, conversation that you'll have with your doctor if you need these but they work very well and they do a good job of protecting the nerve from further damage because um, unlike cataracts, damage to the optic nerve and with glaucoma is irreversible. So once the damage is there, we can't um, bring back the nerve, but we really want to, and the goal of the treatment is to prevent any future damage. Another good option is laser treatment. This can be a first line treatment, or this can be in addition to the eye drops that I talked about previously. Um, but these are also well studied, work really well. Um, and um, I like laser for a lot of patients just because it means that we can do something in the office and then you don't have to worry about doing the eye drops at home every day or picking them up from the pharmacy every month. So it's usually, um, again, a discussion that I have with my patients about what works best for them um, in terms of what they prefer and what they adhere to, because both um, the eye drops and the laser are good options in terms of treatment. Um, if the glaucoma is progressing or we can't get the pressure to a level that we need it to be at safely for the nerve, then the next step is surgery. So there are surgeries that we can do for glaucoma. Um, and those are usually if the other options have failed or not getting us to the target that we want. Um, next, I'm just gonna go through some eye findings that we see with some common disease processes because um, many of these things will affect a large number of the population. So you may have some of these processes um, yourself or know someone else that has um, some of these things. Um, but the first one is diabetes. So diabetic eye disease is a most common cause of vision loss among uh, working age adults. Um, and as the incidence of diabetes increases in the general population, we are definitely seeing a lot of this. Um, the effects of diabetes as well as high blood pressure are cumulative. So if you've been treated for this for a long time, if you have poor control for a long time, then the likelihood of us seeing eye findings increases. Um, diabetes mainly affects the blood vessels and causes them to become leaky. Um, when they do become leaky, we can see some swelling in the back of the eye. Um, it also increases your risk of developing some of the things that we've already talked about, including cataracts, 
cataracts as well as glaucoma. So um, diabetes, if you have a diagnosis of diabetes, really important to work with your primary care doctor or endocrinologist to uh, manage that and keep it under control. Um, and then also come in to see us every year so we can take a look at the back of the eye for any changes. Um, this is a picture I showed at the beginning of what the normal eye looks like. So when I look at your eye, um, if it's nice and healthy, you have your nice healthy nerve here, blood vessels coming off, and then the retina. If I look at someone with diabetes, if they have changes from diabetes, this is an example of what I might see. Um, so instead of the blood being inside the blood vessels, it is leaking outside. And there are also proteins, these yellow spots leaking outside. All of this leads to decreased vision. Um, and then this is the main sight seeing part of the eye. So this decreased vision does affect your main um, part of the eye that you're seeing out of. So this is just an example of what I might see if I look at the back of the eye of someone who has diabetes. Um, similarly, um, hypertensive retinopathy is another thing that we commonly see. So this is related to uncontrolled blood pressure. Um, so this mainly affects the blood vessels. So I showed you that picture of what the normal eye looked like here. Um, so just to compare that, when I look at the back of the eye, that someone has uncontrolled blood pressure, the blood vessels are a little bit more curvy. Um, the middle of the eye has um, these depositions or swelling in it. And then the nerve of the eye that usually has those nice crisp borders um, and outline is sort of blurred. And that tells me that the disc is swollen. So a lot of things that we could potentially see, this is a more severe form of hypertensive retinopathy, probably acutely uncontrolled in this patient. Um, but we can see more subtle changes um, even when it's not uncontrolled like this if you've had um, blood pressure issues for many years. Um, and then the last systemic process I wanted to just mention is HIV. Um, in this day and age, HIV is um, more and more managed with medicine and it's um, likely that many patients with HIV have undetectable viral load and good CD4 counts. So luckily we're not seeing as much HIV retinopathy in recent years, but this is what I might see in a patient that does develop HIV retinopathy. Again, this is the normal eye. And then these are some of the things that you can see um, in HIV retinopathy. It's classically predominantly these white spots. These are just tiny infarcts, almost like tiny strokes that occur in the back of the eye on this superficial layer. Um, so this is a classic finding that we see in HIV retinopathy, again, if HIV is not controlled. Um, so this is just comparing HIV and diabetic retinopathy. So there's a lot of overlap. Sometimes if there are multiple um, disease processes going on, you can have signs of all of these. And it's not always just pure black and white. This is associated with this. Path up this disease and, and this is sort of this disease. You can see all of these with any of the three that I just mentioned. Um, so you can see these white spots in diabetes sometimes. You can see little tiny bleeds in HIV. But these are some of the classic presentations that I might see when I look at the back of your eye when you come in for a dilated exam. And all of these um, can affect the middle central part of your vision, but especially diabetes. Um, that's the one that is most likely to impact your vision um, if it's changing. Um, and then just a couple more eye problems that we notice more as we age. Um, the first being dry eyes. So this affects so many people, um, more common in women than men, and also more common as we get older. Um, so dry eyes is mainly related to this front layer of the eye, which is the tear film. The tear film is made up of a couple different um, sub layers. The biggest layer is called the aqueous layer. So this is the fluid layer. And this is what we replace when you use over-the-counter artificial tears. So because this is the biggest layer, um, often what we would recommend to someone that's experiencing dry eyes is to supplement their aqueous layer by getting some artificial tears. Um, if you aren't sure if you have dry eyes, some of the symptoms include um, irritation, redness, feeling like there's something sandy or gritty in your eye intermittently, um, or if you noticing that you need to blink more, um, or if you notice that your vision is blurry and if you blink, it clears up. Those are all different symptoms that might be associated with um, dry eyes. 
Um, the most superficial layer here of the tear film is actually lipids, so that's fat. So long term, another thing that you can do to kind of address dry eyes is to support this fatty layer by having healthy fats in your diet. So things that are high in omega-3s, um, such as cold water fish, um, nuts and seeds, those really long term can support this lipid layer. Um, and then there are environmental things. So if you're sleeping near a fan blowing on your face, um, or if you're staring at a screen for a long time, um, whether it's a computer screen, a phone, or a TV, those can also affect um, your surface of the eye and are important to take into account. Another um, problem that we see is floaters. So this is very common. You may have noticed these in your um, self, but normally as light comes in, um, it passes through this jelly of the eye. And as we talked about in the beginning, the light lands right on the retina. So normally that passage is nice and clear. The jelly is a clear medium and you can see um, whatever it is in front of you. Over time, that jelly is made of collagen and that collagen composition changes and can make tiny little clumps. So as those clumps form, when light comes through, those little clumps um, cast shadows on the back of the eye. So you may notice these little floating spots. Sometimes there's one dot, sometimes there's a, a few of them. Um, they can be very annoying, very bothersome um, when they first appear. Luckily there's, nothing, luckily, there's nothing that we need to do about these. Um, they, over time, don't disappear, but what happens is your brain starts to just ignore them more and pay less attention so that they're less bothersome, except in special situations. For example, if you're tired at the end of the day or in certain lighting situations, um, then they might become more noticeable. Um, if they are ever associated with a curtain coming across your vision, um, a flash of light, or instead of a couple floaters that are getting less and less noticeable, a whole shower of new floaters that are getting worse, that can mean a problem with the retina, the back of the eye. So if you notice any of those things in addition to these floaters, um, then definitely come in and get evaluated so we can just make sure that everything's okay with the retina. And even when the floaters first present, if you um, are bothered by them or have concerns, you can definitely um, come in and get evaluated. Uh, hold on, let me just mute my phone one second. Okay, and then another um, eye condition that we see with aging is eyelid position. So the eyelids are normally held in place um, by a mix of muscle and connective tissue. As we age, um, as things get more lax, you can notice a couple different things associated with the eyelids. For example, in this patient, you can kind of see the skin is folding over. So the actual front eyelid can fold down, that's called ptosis. The skin in front of that can actually fold over. Um, and then the bottom lid can also get affected too, it can become more lax. Um, and what that can cause is problems with irritation and dryness because it doesn't blink as well. Um, also the bottom lid is important for directing the liquid on the surface of the eye, the tear film to the tear drainage system. So if it kind of droops over here, it doesn't drain the eyes as well. So sometimes patients can report a lot of tearing. So some of this um, is cosmetic, but there are a lot of functional things that can be affected by the eyelid position. Um, for example, as this droops more, it can affect your peripheral vision. Um, and as this kind of um, laxity develops, it can affect just how well your surface stays lubricated and how well that tear film stays in its place and how well it drains off. So there are definitely things that um, develop over time related to eyelid position that sometimes we need to address. Um, and then just some tips to maintain eye health as we age and just in general, um, most of these I've already mentioned, but just to drive them home. Um, when you are outside, um, wear sunglasses, wear UV protection, because that is the main thing to slow down progression of cataracts. And it's um, just a little bit every day can be cumulative. So every time you walk from your car to your home, et cetera, that little bit of UV exposure over time, over many years is what um, progresses the cataracts. Um, secondly, just eat a diet rich in colorful fruits and vegetables. Um, like I mentioned earlier, these are usually high in antioxidants, which slow down the aging process, especially for the lens of the eye. 
um, which leads to cataracts if it is oxidized. And then the back of the eye, um, the retina, um, where macular degeneration affects it. Um, eat healthy fats and foods that are rich in omega-3s, including fish, nuts, and seeds. These are really important for your tear film long-term. So that's um, another thing that you can incorporate. Avoid smoking. If you are smoking, try and cut back or stop. And if you haven't started at this point, continue to avoid that because again, that affects aging of the whole body, including the eyes. Um, and then regularly visit your ophthalmologist because some of these things like glaucoma that I mentioned um, may not have symptoms early on. So it's important, especially if you have any family history or if you have any of the diseases that I mentioned, such as high blood pressure um, or um, diabetes, to just visit us regularly so we can find things and treat them on the earlier side rather than later. And with that, Thank you guys so much for your time. I'm definitely open to any questions that you guys have. Um, I know that was a lot of information, but a lot of the things that we see are very common. You might have experienced them or you know someone that has experienced them. So um, hopefully that was helpful for you guys. Yes, I have a question. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I have a friend who's listening. She was unable to log on. Mm -hmm. And this directly affects her husband. He was diagnosed with macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. Monica, you on? Wait, uh-huh, wait. Okay, wait. you can talk to her now. Yes. Um, my husband was diagnosed with wet macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. And um, he is currently, read the doctor now, he's getting his second injection. Mm -hmm. um, normally, is that something that you would have to do for the rest of your life? Yeah, so with wet macular degeneration, it is a long-term treatment as long as there is fluid, which makes it the wet form. Um, so initially, he's not getting his second one now. So initially, there's a series of at least three injections spaced out about a month apart. Um, and then depending how the patient responds, um, sometimes that interval in terms of follow-up and needing treatment can be spaced out further. Um, but the main thing that he'll have to do at home is to kind of monitor for symptoms. So um, I mentioned like if things that are strict, supposed to be straight look wavy or crooked, um, and they may have sent him home also with a grid that has little squares that he can even check that on. If anything looks distorted or crooked, that means that the fluid is coming back and that's a reason to go in um, sooner than your scheduled follow-up um, because it might need another treatment. But initially the treatments are pretty close together, a few weeks to a month apart. Um, and then after the first few, you can space them out further, but it is something that needs to be followed long-term because the fluid can come back. Injection. We're here at the doctor now, but okay. he also has a machine that he um, that he has to to look at every day. He looks through this machine, and it sends a signal or something to an off-site place. And if they notice anything, then they'll contact the doctor. Okay, and awesome. The doctor will tell him to come in. Okay, yo. So it sounds like he has a combination of like telemonitoring. So that's really. Great, that's awesome because then they'll detect it earlier and have him come back okay. right away. So okay. that sounds really good. Okay. Yeah. Now he has um, the wet macular degeneration in the left eye, and mm -hmm. the right eye, they said he has dry. Mm -hmm. And they're monitoring really that dry eye to make sure that it doesn't progress to the wet. It, mm -hmm. um, you know, and he takes prevision. They told him to take prevision. Mm -hmm. So he takes that twice a day. The pill. Yeah, so there's no treatment for the dry form. Um, the Preservision is a multivitamin that's specially formulated, especially for dry if you have um, high risk dry macular degeneration or if you have dry macular degeneration in one eye with wet in the other. So it has um, high doses of certain vitamins like vitamin A, lutein, xanthine. So those are really to support the back of the eye. Um, and that is a well-studied formulation that came out of the NIH, the NEI. So that's definitely good long-term. It doesn't do anything like short-term. It's not gonna reverse the macular de degeneration, but it will support the eye um, long-term and hopefully he doesn't develop that wet form. Um, and okay. if he does, that's when the treatment comes in. Mm -hmm. Repeat that, Monica. Yeah, is there anything else he can do or does it look like what he's doing is, is proper, you know, 
Yeah. It sounds like he's doing the right things. I mean, he's under care of an ophthalmologist. He's getting the medicine. Um, and then just to reiterate smoking cessation, if he's a smoker to avoid smoking, that's another yeah. good one. Okay. Okay. No, I think he's doing everything so right. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. No nope. problem. Okay. 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 Thank you. Bye. -bye. I have a couple of the main issues, doctor. Um, John here. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was awesome. Um, I have about five or six questions, but I'm, okay. I'm just going to ask three because I think I can re relate to most of the things you talk about. You didn't okay. mention anything about conjunctivitis. Uh, conjunctivitis. So conjunctivitis is um, affects the white part of the eye. So if you're looking in the mirror really closely, you'll see the white part of the eye um, in between like the brown part of the eye and the eyelids. So that's your conjunctiva. Conjunctivitis is just inflammation of the conjunctiva. So it can happen from a lot of different things. It can be infectious, such as a virus. Um, that's the most common cause. Um, it can be bacterial. It can be allergic. Um, so it's basically redness on, that develops in those blood vessels on the white part of the eye. It is very common. I didn't talk about it as much. It doesn't especially happen um, as we age, but it can affect anyone. It actually affects kids a lot because they're in like close contact with other people, um, spreading a lot of germs. So they get the infectious kind. Um, for most conjunctivitis, um, if it's viral, there's no treatment. It's mainly just kind of keeping the eyes comfortable, making sure the surface is lubricated, making sure you're not spreading it to the other eye or to other people. Um, if it's bacterial, we give you antibiotics. If it's allergic, then we treat the allergies either with eye drops or um, looking to treat the systemic um, allergic component. So um, conjunctivitis is very common. Um, depending on the cause of it, we can treat that appropriately as well. Okay, uh, second question. Is macular degeneration genetic? There is some proposed genetic component to it. Um, the it's most common in Caucasian um, people of Caucasian descent and then also women. So um, it can occur in anyone though, but um, that's the common population that it's seen in, in the literature. And my, my father had it, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. And uh, yeah, I have floaters. I think I've got insects flying around the house. <laughs> um, and the last question I, I have, these uh, concretions on the inside of my mm -hmm. eyelid that have to be every now and then removed. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any cause for that? Is something that I can do with diet to get rid of those? Yeah, so concretions are usually are little almost like calcium deposits that can occur in the on the back of the eyelid or in the corner of the eye. And those are from chronic, usually chronic low-grade um, inflammation of the eyelids and eyelashes. So the main things that you can do to try and prevent those from developing are to keep the eyelids and eyelashes um, as comfortable and healthy as possible. So a couple small things that you can do, um, a warm compress, like a warm washcloth or a warm rag, run it under hot water, wring it out, Rest that against your eye. Do that once or twice a day, um, or even just a couple times a week if you can't do it that often. What that does is kind of keeps the oils flowing that line the eyelids and eyelashes. And then a second thing you can do um, when you wash your face, pay special attention to the eyelashes. So the eyelashes, their job is to keep all of the things in the environment out from the surface of the eye. So they catch the dust, the pollen, even the skin cells that you're shedding throughout the day and keep those on the eyelashes instead of um, letting that come onto the surface of the eye. So when you wash your face, just pay special attention to the eyelashes, gently rub, rub, rub to kind of dislodge all that stuff, get rid of that stuff every day. Um, you can even use like a little bit of tear-free baby shampoo, Johnson & Johnson or whatever brand to kind of just scrub, scrub, scrub that on a daily basis. If you get rid of those um, irritants and allergens on a regular basis um, and you keep the oils flowing, then it's less likely to develop um, some of those signs of um, chronic low-grade inflammation like the concretions. Last question. You just mentioned something, rubbing your eyes. Can you talk mm -hmm. about that? 
So, I mean, rubbing your eyes throughout the day, not good. If you have allergies, not good. But cleaning your eyelids and eyelashes, that is okay. So when you're washing your face, gently rub them as you're cleaning them. So with warm water and baby shampoo. And that's just to mechanically dislodge anything that kind of attaches to those eyelashes and get rid of that. But rubbing your eyes throughout the day usually means there's something else going on. Um, mm -hmm. It could mean that you have allergies. It could mean that you have dryness. So that's something we want to look into. So it's two separate, but um, yeah, just intermittent rubbing throughout the day, not so good. Intentional rubbing to kind of clean the eyelashes, that is good. Thank you so much. Yep. Dr. Chin Loy, this is the other John. <laughs> uh, I also enjoyed your presentation, very informative. Uh, did you talk about itchy eyes? So I didn't specifically, but I now I know, like since that was mentioned, conjunctivitis and itchy eyes, um, I didn't specifically talk about that, but itchy eyes usually can be a couple different things. One could be allergies. So um, if you have a pattern to your itchiness, like seasonal, then that's almost always allergic, um, allergic conjunctivitis. We treat that with some eye drops that are antihistamines. Um, if the Itching eyes are associated with um, like sneezing, runny nose, or other systemic signs of allergy, then you should definitely take an oral um, allergy medicine, um, Claritin, Zyrtec, um, Allegra, because that will also help with the eye symptoms usually. Um, and then if the itching doesn't have any pattern, um, it can sometimes be associated with the inflammation of the eyelids and eyelashes that I was talking about with the other John. So just kind of cleaning off your eyelashes at the end of the day is a good thing to do to help with both the allergic and the inflammatory causes. Because um, if there is, like I said, dust or pollen or other things that get on your eyelashes, you want to get rid of that before you go to sleep because if you're asleep lying down and that has time to just kind of linger there and cause a reaction, then it's going to be more bothersome to you. So kind of at the end of the day, it's usually the best time if you've been out and about um, before you go to sleep to just kind of do that gentle wash of the eyelids and eyelashes with a little baby shampoo um, to just kind of get rid of all of those potential irritants and allergens on a daily or regular basis. Dr. Chen Loy, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I have a question about night vision. A lot of my friends avoid driving at night because of loss of night vision. Is there anything that can be done to treat it and regain night vision? So that is classically something that we see as cataracts progress. So I don't know if they've been evaluated for cataracts, but cataracts um, are in the lens of the eye. So that affects the light as it passes through. Um, if the cataract is blocking the light, then less light is getting to the retina, which is the part that transmits the light into a message to our brain. So classically, when patients develop cataract, night driving is one of the early things that they report. Um, also, the other issue, not just being able to see well at night, but the headlights um, from oncoming traffic, that's a common thing that patients with cataract report having trouble with. Instead of the lights looking crisp and round, they almost look like starburst. Um, there's a glare that appears around them. That is, again, usually cataract. So um, if they're having those symptoms, um, I would def definitely recommend they get evaluated for cataracts um, because if it is cataracts that is causing symptoms that are affecting their ability to do the things that they like to do, like drive at night um, or maintain independence, then that is definitely something that we can treat. Um, and like I said earlier, cataracts, if that's the only thing going on, that's a reversible cause of low vision. Um, but sometimes these go hand in hand with macular degeneration, glaucoma, other things that unfortunately are not reversible, but cataracts themselves, very um, common, and those are reversible. That's my first thought if I hear someone's having trouble driving at night, it's probably cataracts. Um, and then, I mean, it could be something as simple as a refractive error, meaning needing glasses, if they haven't had a recent glasses prescription check. Um, so definitely I would get evaluated um, to look and make sure that there's not cataracts going on or some other process. Awesome presentation. Quick question. Mm -hmm. You talked about um, strengthening the eye and how food and your um, diet is good for that. Is there or are there any exercise that you can do to help maintain the functionality and the strength in your mm -hmm. eye? 
So certain um, vision problems, such as problems um, focusing up close, you can do exercises to get the eye in that pattern and looking up close. Um, in terms of the eyes, the eye muscles that keep the eye in place and aligned can get fatigued. So if you are staring at a screen for a long time, um, if you're especially like a computer or a phone for a long time, those muscles can get tired from being in the same position for a long time. So um, most people have heard of 2020 vision is perfect. So there's actually a rule that our um, academy came out with called 202020. So an extra 20, because most people have heard of 2020. Um, and that is every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. So when you're at a screen, take those intentional breaks to look at something a different distance to just kind of reset the eye muscles um, to force yourself to blink so that you can address the dry eyes as well. Um, so that's one small thing that you can do if you're um, especially at a screen or looking at one distance for a long time to give those muscles a break. Um, otherwise, in terms of exercises, there aren't any specific exercises that you need to do um, for your eyes. Thank you. Can you talk Dr. with Jello. us about the, um, you know, you see a lot of girls with these um, um, detachable eyelashes. What are the pros and cons <laughs> about the eyelashes? Um, pros, I guess, would be that they feel good and they like the way they look. There are a lot of cons, though, from an ophthalmologist standpoint. Um, they cause a lot of problems from our standpoint. They can cause um, infections. They can cause allergies to glue or even reactions to glue. We've seen eyelids um, glued together. Um, we've seen bacteria that build up on the base of these lashes if they um, aren't removed and cared for regularly. Um, they can affect your peripheral vision as well. So from our standpoint, we encourage patients not to use them. Um, I guess the main con is just kind of um, feeling good and feeling pretty and, and what that brings to you as an individual. But um, from an eye care standpoint, they mainly cause a lot of problems with inflammation, um, infection, and allergy. Thank you. Are there any safe eye cosmetics, uh, including cat? mascara, eyeliner, and eyeshadow, or do you discourage use of any of those? No, I mean, things like uh, mascara and eye makeup, there are some safer brands out there. You can look at um, like E3B. Um, they have like lists of them online, but um, the main thing with any eye makeup, if you wear it, is to take it off um, before you go to sleep. So take it off on a daily basis. If you leave it there um, for a long time, that's when it can cause problems, especially overnight. Um, and then also just making sure the um, products that you're using are not expired. Um, some of them can last a long time if you don't use them that frequently. So if you're using expired um, makeup, then that can also cause problems with the eye. So just making sure they're not expired and that you're removing it on a daily basis. Um, and you can even use the baby shampoo for that process, but there are um, eye safe makeup um, removers that are also good to use. Why are you asking, Daryl? <laughs> I'm asking for a friend. I don't use any eye cosmetics. <laughs> uh, see, see, Daryl, we know that beauty can be painful sometimes. And so it's, you know, it's what we go through. Um, doctor, I have a question for you regarding um, LASIK surgery. Mm -hmm. um, the pros and cons, short term and long term, because mm -hmm. I've had friends who've had it um, to correct nearsightedness. And then after about five or six years, they go back to needing glasses again. Um, but others who have it and it's great forever. And mm -hmm. so um, there may be a couple, three different kind of procedures or type of LASIK because we, you know, LASIK is, LASIK is like Kleenex. You know, mm -hmm. when you hear about eye surgery, you think it's just one thing. Exactly. Um, and so what are the, um, what are the positives and the um, long-term um, yeah. effects of that? So LASIK, the most common form of LASIK, well, LASIK is a form of laser vision correction. So the LASIK that's been around for a long time basically makes a little opening in the front window of the eye, the cornea, um, and then will change the shape of your front of the eye so that the light is focused um, well on the retina, in the, like in those pictures we saw earlier. Um, main thing with 
any laser vision correction is you want the eye to be stable and you don't want there to be other causes of decreased vision. So the optimal time to get LASIK is around like your 20s, maybe even your 30s, because at that point you're out of puberty adolescence when you're growing and the eye is changing, but the eye is stable um, and you haven't developed um, like the need for glasses for near yet presbyopia, you haven't developed cataract or other things. Um, so if you get LASIK or laser vision correction in that window, most people do really well. Um, the most, one of the most common things that we see people report is that they have increased dryness after. So that's because when we do LASIK, we um, cut some of the nerves on the cornea in order to do the procedure. So there is some increased um, dryness that is reported so you may have to use artificial tears more frequently. Um, some of the newer techniques um, don't cut as many nerves. So that risk and that side effect is becoming less um, common. So that's one of the common things. Um, there is also a possibility that that um, change that they make in the cornea, the, it's called a flap, can be dislodged. So if you are engaged in like martial arts or other things where you might have contact with people, you're probably not a good candidate for that because it can get dislodged and that would decrease your vision. Um, over time, there is a risk of what we call regression. So the front of the eye can change shape over time. If that happens, um, some places that offer LASIK will offer like a touch up. So you may need just another treatment um, down the road in, a, in the future. And then the other reason why sometimes it seems like it's not working as well anymore is because you can develop cataracts, you can develop other things that aren't um, on the cornea, the front window of the eye that's treated that can affect your vision. Um, and then eventually everyone, um, depending how long you live, will develop cataracts. And then we can use that as a way to correct and improve your vision by treating the cataracts. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a large population that can do really well with LASIK if it's um, timed during those like good years where you can get a long-term benefit of it. Um, if you're in your 40s or beyond or any sign of cataract, at that point, the the length of time that you'd get the benefit from LASIK isn't as, as much. So usually we recommend just waiting till you might need cataract surgery in a few years, and then we can correct the vision at that time instead of undergoing two different surgeries. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, doctor, um, thank you for answering my friend's questions, but she had one more question. Mm -hmm. Is there a cure for the wet degeneration? At this time, no cure. So the treatments that we have with the injections, mm -hmm. there are a couple different ones. Like even a couple years ago or a decade ago, there was like one main medicine that we could give now. Then the different options are more. Um, so they're constantly looking into better treatment options that last longer um, because going back every few weeks or every month or so is definitely burdensome. Um, but at this point, there's no cure, but maybe in the future. All right, good. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, I Hello. agree with all the other people that said it was a great presentation. Um, my question is, um, what are your thoughts on the new things that are coming out to cover the puffiness or under your eye. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, comments on them or are they, are they good, bad, or otherwise? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, puffiness around the eyes can be a couple of different um, things. It can be from just water retention. So um, if you're taking any medicine or a diuretic for blood pressure, kind of just making sure that you're using that. It can be from allergies. So if there's any itching or allergic component, we definitely treat that. Um, but the most common reason we see puffy eyes or what is referred to as puffy eyes as we get older is because the layer called the septum that holds the fats back um, all around the eyes gets loosened and stretched out. So it's oftentimes that the fat that's there um, kind of protrudes a little bit more. So unfortunately for that, there's no um, immediate treatment that we have available. Um, there can be a procedure that you can do to kind of correct that. But a lot of things that you see like commercially available or even in like media about like cucumbers or cool compresses, that's an exaggeration, but they can help. So just kind of decreasing 
um, the blood flow there and um, using anything that's cooling, like a cooling pad um, or a cooling mask, that can help a little bit, um, but ultimately it's an anatomical cause usually. So that would require an additional treatment. But um, yeah, anything that you can do to maintain the he overall health and collagen of your eyes and your the rest of your body um, through some of the healthy things in the diet um, and then just related to sun exposure can help long-term. Okay, but these new cosmetic things that are coming on the market, are they kind of bad? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say take them like with a grain of salt. They all have really good marketing and are gonna make you think that they're mm -hmm. like the fountain of youth. And um, I mean, I know they're I, temporary, but yeah, it's all temporary. So if it helps you a little bit, then I would say you can go for it. But long term, it's there's nothing yet that we have that um, is a cream that can can really reverse things. Um, things that are high in retinol or retin um, can actually help with some of that skin around there. Um, but if you take too high doses, like over what's recommended, then that can have some toxic effects um, on the eye specifically. So um, definitely if you do try anything that's over the counter, use what's recommended, not using more than that because there can be some adverse effects. Uh, doctor, uh, uh, getting back to the bags under the eyes, what do you think about uh, plastic surgery for mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so I, I briefly mentioned this in the talk, but I think there is definitely um, an avenue for that and a use for that because the puffiness as well as um, how it affects how well that eyelid is positioned up against the eye can have not just cosmetic effects, but can have some functional problems. Um, the eyelids are really important for just kind of keeping the tears on the surface of the eye, directing the tears to the right way. So there is some not only cosmetic, but functional reasons why you might need um, eyelid surgery on the upper or even the lower eyelids um, if that starts to affect um, your comfort, if it starts to affect your peripheral vision, if it affects um, your tearing, um, et cetera. So there's definitely um, utility in eyelid surgery in some patients. Uh, one other question, doctor. Uh, how often should we cry? <laughs> so your tear film is constantly making and replenishing tears on the surface. So we do get this question and some patients will come and say that they can't cry and that they're worried about that. Um, as long as your surface is healthy, you don't need to necessarily um, make yourself cry more or less, but we want those layers of the tear film to be healthy and in good balance. So the main layer, the aqueous layer, um, if your surface is, is dry, then we can replenish that. Um, that superficial lipid layer, that's those healthy omega-3s. If you um, are having trouble crying too much or too little, um, both of those can be signs of dry eyes. Um, and again, you can incorporate more of those healthy omega-3s in your diet. Um, but the over-the-counter artificial tears actually can help um, with tearing, whether that's too much or too little. Um, often it's confusing because when you're crying a lot, you're thinking that the eyes can't possibly be dry. Um, but sometimes you're crying a lot because the surface of the eye is getting a message that the surface is dry. So it's making more tears, but they might not be healthy and they might not be staying on the surface of the eye. So sometimes even when you're crying a lot, the surface of the eye can be dry. Um, and that's when that important balance between the fats, the lipids and the liquid layer comes into play. Oh, thank quick, you. Question, quick question about um, these uh, big screen TVs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now we have a, a 80 inch <laughs> TV, 100 inch. Uh, they used to say, you know, you sh shouldn't watch those too closely. What's what's the relationship between is, is there damage done by watching TV too closely? 
Yeah, I mean, there in children, there have been studies that um, screen time up close can actually lead to a progression of what we call myopia. So more nearsightedness, um, which means that they'll have trouble seeing far away and need glasses. So I think the window for when that's really important is definitely in, in children. There are a lot of studies on this, especially out of China, and when they where they have really high um, levels of myopia. Um, in terms of um, some of the studies that we've um, produced out of the United States, there is evidence that children should get at least two hours of outside time a day to slow down progression of myopia. So we see this not only with television, but also when we were um, doing school on Zoom and, and other screens when children were getting a lot of screen time, um, that there is a progression of myopia if um, especially children are focusing on um, these screens up close. Once you're kind of out of that age range, it's not as important. So I think that that's really the window um, up through age 20 when the eyes are changing and growing that you want to try and make sure that kids are getting outside time. Because when you're outside, most of your activities are going to be further away. You're looking at your friends, you're looking at things that are beyond arm's reach. When you're inside looking at a screen, that's all within arm's reach. So the eyes um, focus up close and kind of develop in that way. Um, the other thing that we often get asked about with TVs is blue light, like whether you should have blue light blockers. Um, so blue light comes from a lot of different sources. The biggest source is actually the sun. Um, but then we also get a lot of blue light from all the screens that we use, the computers, phones, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of blue light blockers, you don't necessarily need to pay extra money for those in your glasses. The biggest thing is though, if you're using screens late at night, um, if you're getting that blue light when the sun is down. So the sun as a blue light source helps to regulate your circadian rhythms when your brain knows to be awake and asleep. Um, but if you're getting blue light outside of that normal pattern, that can throw off your circadian rhythm. So if you are using screens um, late into night, watching TV late into night, um, and you're having trouble sleeping, then that's a situation where you might want to consider blue light blockers in your lens, or a lot of the screens and phones have um, special settings that um, can uh, um, have like a night mode that you can use that is less blue light. Um, so if that's something that you're noticing, um, definitely try and limit your TV watching or um, blue light exposure close to bedtime. Hi, my, my name is Carol Tatum. Enjoy the presentation. Um, I have two questions that are off the wall. I know that most ophthalmologists do not have contacts, and but they can prescribe them for their patients. And I notice you have glasses on. How come you don't have contacts? And then the second question, what good are eyebrows? You know, in fashion design, women used to have real thin eyebrows and they not have any. And now the fashions mode is to have thick eyebrows. So mm -hmm. are eyebrows any enhancement or any way facilitating our seeing better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, similar, a lot of ophthalmologists wear glasses, they don't wear contacts or get laser vision correction. And that's, I mean, personal choice, but I think we see a lot of the problems with laser vision correction or a lot of problems with contact lenses. Um, if patients don't take care of their contacts, if they sleep in them, we see a lot of really bad infections um, related to contacts. So definitely issues that we see with um, like dryness from laser vision correction or infections from contact lens wearing that um, we don't see with glasses. Glasses themselves usually don't cause problems with the eye. So we don't see a lot of subsequent problems with the eyes. Um, obviously there are advantages of contact lenses and there's like an area outside of the frame of the lenses that is blurry if you're not wearing contacts. So contacts have some use, um, obviously certain sports and, and other activities where it might be beneficial to wear contacts instead. So it's not that I'm against contacts, but we do see a lot of problems when contact lenses are not used appropriately or cared for cared for um, appropriately. Um, and then related to eyebrows, um, so the eyebrows and the eyelashes, um, the their use for both of them is to protect the eyes. So they basically kind of just act like these filters to keep the bad stuff off of the eye. So position kind of right at your, at the bone structure there, um, again, to kind of keep 
uh, allergens, other things off of your eyes um, and out of that eye socket. So they do have a role function, but um, because everyone um, for the most part has them, unless you have certain um, processes or have elected to remove them, um, they are part of your look and part of your fashion now. So um, I think if um, you're able to uh, kind of maintain them and, and keep them nice and healthy, then they don't cause any problems. They're there mainly to protect the eyes. Dr. Chin Loy, mm -hmm. how often should one see an ophthalmologist? Yeah, so it depends on what you have going on. At a minimum, I would recommend every year. So um, as we age, like I said earlier, everyone eventually develops cataracts. Um, so once you develop cataracts, um, you should get evaluated at least every year to decide on the timing of cataract surgery. Um, if you have diabetes or high blood pressure, um, again, you should get evaluated at least once every year. So I would say at least once every year, we can always um, just check in, make sure that there's nothing um, that's asymptomatic going on like glaucoma. Um, but if you have other things that need to be treated, so if you do get diagnosed with glaucoma, for example, you should be seen back every few months. Same thing with macular degeneration. Generation. Once you're diagnosed with something and need treatment, the follow-up will depend on that. Um, uh, actually, Norman Brooks, did you have some questions? Yes. Speaking of um, prescriptions, mm -hmm. when one prescription is written and it's submitted to be filled, mm -hmm. and that particular prescription doesn't fall under a person's insurance plan, mm -hmm. Does the ophthalmologist get a message or a note to let them know <clears throat> that they need to rewrite that particular prescription and not have to wait to see the, the uh, ophthalmologist, which could be, in my case, a month and a half. Mm -hmm. And then I'm without medication. Yeah. So the most effective thing is to send a message to the eye doctor's office. We do sometimes, depending on the insurance or the pharmacy, get some notifications. And then if that happens, we can send um, a different prescription, but that doesn't always happen. So um, in terms of just kind of closing the loop and connecting, um, if you can leave a message with your eye doctor, that's the best way. Okay. I get a message from my insurance company and the message reads that my ophthalmologist is going to be contacted as well, which means that a, another prescription has to be written. Mm -hmm. So who yeah. does the follow-up, the pharmacy department, the ophthalmologist or the patient? So if your insurance sends you that letter, that means that they are the ones that are initiating a change. So they will send us a similar letter. And then our, for example, in our clinic, our technicians um, go through those letters on a daily basis and will update the changes and send a new thing to the pharmacy. So if we get letters, so with certain insurances, we do get information like that. So if we do get those letters, then we will send replacements directly and, and there's nothing to do on the patient's end. Um, but if your insurance, if you just go to the pharmacy and they tell you that it's not covered, then we don't hear about that just because um, the pharmacy itself says it can't be covered. But um, it depends if the insurance is acting as an intermediary on your behalf and kind of sharing that information. Um, we try and generally um, prescribe for the most part generic if those are tolerated because they work as well as the brand. Um, certain patients, if they, for example, with eye drops need preservative free ones or, or other things, then we sometimes need to give the brand or if they've tried the generic and it didn't seem to work as well, then we give the brand. But for the most part, um, a lot of the generic um, eye drops, especially for like glaucoma are usually well covered, but it can vary um, depending. Yeah, in my case, the prescription was written, but the dosage was uh -huh. too high and it fell into another category, which means that my particular prescription is not going to be filled. Then it has to go back to the ophthalmologist to write another one. So in the meantime- yeah, so need to connect because you're not getting the right medicine then. Right. Yeah. So 
does the ophthalmologist get any kind of information from the insurance company to let them know that they need to write yeah, another if, prescription? If the insurance companies is sending out information like the letter that you got, then our office gets a letter as well. We get a copy of it. Yeah. The letters, unfortunately, can lead to some delays because it's through the mail system, the hospital sorting system, then it comes to the clinic. By the time that happens, it could be a week since they denied it and sent that letter. So there's definitely gaps. So that's another opportunity if that is happening to reach out to the office directly. How often do you recommend getting a second opinion? Um, I mean, if you have a good board certified ophthalmologist, um, then they should be practicing standard of care. And I, I don't think it's often necessary, but if you have something that you're uncomfortable with or something that um, like you've talked to other people and they've had like a different uh, treatment plan for something similar, then I say it's always your right and, and encouraged to get a second opinion. Um, but for the most part, um, based on kind of your unique exam, your ophthalmologist will try and have your best interest in, in mind and trying to do the best thing. It's also hard when you hear like your other friends like got something else because they don't know the whole story. They don't know what your vision is at the exam, what your pressure is, so all the details. So um, I think sometimes it's easy to hear um, people maybe had things done a little bit differently, but it's not the exact same situation, even though it sounds similar. So it's always encouraged, but I think it's often not usually necessarily, not usually necessary. Um, the main situations are um, if you are recommended for surgery and it's not something that you are interested or comfortable in, um, then you can always get a second opinion about that. And you can always also decline surgery as well. Um, that's your autonomy as well. As uh, you know, if you have a glaucoma, are there many different glaucoma specialists available? Uh, or is that uh, uh, an area where you have a, a small number of uh, glaucoma specialists? Since that's a problem that we see with the African-American population, this is a source of concern. Right. Um, at Howard, we have two glaucoma specialists. Um, many places, many of the um, like hospital institutions in, in the city will have at least one glaucoma specialist. Um, but there's definitely always a need, like you said, um, the prevalence of glaucoma um, in the aging population is definitely high, and especially in patients of African descent. So um, it's definitely something that we're constantly looking to recruit more specialists for, um, but most places should have at least one um, glaucoma specialist. And then I'm a comprehensive ophthalmologist. I manage glaucoma up until it needs surgery. So most comprehensive ophthalmologists can kind of follow up with glaucoma, can do the test for glaucoma, evaluate, kind of do lasers, do eye drops. Um, and so if it's like a mild to moderate glaucoma, that actually can be managed by um, someone who's not a glaucoma specialist because the glaucoma specialists are often so busy um, taking care of the more severe disease. So if you're having trouble um, getting in with a glaucoma specialist and you aren't sure what stage of glaucoma you are or if you even have glaucoma, then often a good place to start is with a comprehensive ophthalmologist because if you need that higher level of care, then we can direct you there. Um, but if you don't, then we can kind of manage you um, in a way that doesn't require that level. Uh by the way, this is the largest attendance we've ever had. So oh, really? awesome. must, have heard, must have heard you were coming. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Chinlaw, who's done such a superb job of educating us about uh, eye disease? She's, she's particularly addressed the uh, eye disease of the aging because I asked her to. So uh, if you have any other questions, please. This is the time. And then I'll put my email in the chat. If you guys have um, other questions, you can always reach out to me directly and I'm happy to answer that. And then um, we do take care of um, all patients here at Howard. So um, if you have any eye disease, whether it's the retina for macular degeneration, glaucoma, et cetera, we can assist um, if you need help getting plugged in somewhere. Uh, this is Elizabeth. Thank you, doctor. A wonderful presentation. 
Uh, mm -hmm. As a wellness coach, I really appreciate your reinforcing those things I talk about daily um, to um, live that healthy lifestyle. I had a little technology um, um, problem. So you may have already addressed this. Did you talk about the OTC, OCT exam? The OCT exam? So OCT, I didn't really get into that. OCT exam is something that we use to scan the, usually the layers of the retina, although it can be used for other parts of the eye. So it uses a special technology um, to look at the layers of the retina. It's especially useful for macular degeneration and diabetes because we can see if there is active um, wet form, active swelling, active fluid there. We also use it to look at the nerve um, and how healthy and thick the nerve is compared to other people um, your age. So that is useful um, in terms of tracking glaucoma progression. So the OCT is definitely a great technology. We use it every day. I didn't get into detail about it too much here, but um, it measures thickness down to micron. So it's very, very specific um, and it's based on um, age match controls to give us an idea of um, if something is falling out of a usual range and maybe needs to be monitored a little bit more closely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, doctor, uh, we've heard a lot about the macular degeneration, uh, especially with aging uh, clients. So is there anything that we can do to prevent it? Mm -hmm. So preventing, um, unfortunately, nothing that we have to prevent it altogether. Um, the Preservision or the Arids vitamins, those are good long-term um, because they just maintain the retina health. Um, they're high in those vitamins that are antioxidants, A, C, and E, lutein, and xanthin. Um, so the formulation in that vitamin, the Preservision, has been studied um, in detail. So the exact amounts of each and the formulation is well studied. So that's something that you can take. That's like um, a 10 year plus kind of treatment in terms of just kind of maintaining that health. So it's not something that you can take um, and right away you would see any sort of benefits, but that and the smoking, I think are the biggest things in terms of um, preventing AMD. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, doctor, it, it's some truth about what is said about carrots. You know, mm -hmm. I heard coming up that carrots were good for your eyesight, and according to you, it's a you know vegetable that has color in it, mm -hmm. and um, it probably has uh, beta carotene. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beta carotene, lutein, xanthine, all of those in that family are very good for the eyes. So yeah, I know it's kind of like a joke in the cartoons, but it's true. It does help you. And again, I mean, it's not like you can take a specific prescription of like two carrots a day or anything like that, but just kind of those habits over the long term can definitely help um, with your overall eye health as well as the rest of your body. Speaking of carrots, the, the miniature carrots versus versus the regular long carrots, which is better for you? Or the, the, the both about the same? About the same, yeah. I mean, whatever is easier for you to take regularly um, should do the trick. Content-wise, it's the same. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to thank you for the group for the splendid presentation today. Well, uh, one more question. One question more, if you don't mind. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot for a very wonderful presentation. I have just a, a simple question. Mm -hmm. uh, a cousin of mine is approaching uh, 80 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he can read. Mm -hmm. He can uh, see very well. Uh, drive. And then, uh, but the doctors examined his eye and told him that uh, he needed, uh, he, that he's uh, developing, um, I think, glaucoma. Mm -hmm. And they are encouraging him for eye surgery. Mm -hmm. But he does not want to mm -hmm. go under uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. So, in your own point of view, is mm -hmm. considering his age, mm -hmm. you know, 80 years old, what does he need? eye surgery for? 
Yeah. Definitely. I mean, like I was saying earlier, for glaucoma, usually mm-hmm. the first line is drops or laser. So if it's at the point of glaucoma that either, I mean, at the point of surgery, that either means they weren't able to control it with those other forms mm-hmm. um, or that it's really, really a bad stage. So um, it can also be possible that he's confusing glaucoma and cataracts. We often get patients coming in saying that they have one, but on the exam, it's actually the other because those are both so common. Um, Mm -hmm. For cataracts, the treatment, definitive treatment is surgery. Um, So it could be that he has cataracts and maybe got it confused. Um, Glaucoma, we can treat with medicines and laser before we get to the point of surgery. So I would just kind of um, go back and, and review that If he's not having symptoms, that is also sort of in line with glaucoma, because like I mentioned, it often affects the periphery. So you can have 20-20 vision here and can be losing vision out here. Um, The thing about glaucoma is that it's irreversible. So if he's not getting treated and the pressure is still high, um, Mm. then he can lose more and more vision. Um, So definitely you do want to treat glaucoma to prevent any further um, vision loss because it is irreversible in the early stages. It can be asymptomatic. You can see great and not realize that you're losing vision out there. Surgery is a treatment option for glaucoma, but it's usually after we've tried some of the other things. Um, and then possibly if he's getting it confused with cataracts, um, cataracts, the definitive treatment is a surgery, but only okay. if it's visually significant. So if you're functioning well and you're not bothered by the vision, then that's not someone that I would do cataract surgery in. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank guys. you. Mm-hmm. No, no problem. Doctor, uh, one more question. Mm-hmm. Um, you said something about you can have 20-20 vision mm-hmm. and your peripheral vision can be very bad. Mm-hmm. So what should you do in that case? Should you try to do something to correct your per- peripheral vision? Unfortunately, for example, with glaucoma, once you lose that peripheral vision, you can't recover it. So the main thing is to make sure you're getting treatment so that it doesn't enclose even more on the main um, central part of your vision. So nothing to recover that vision. Um, But yeah, in terms of what we define as blindness, it can be 2200, meaning what you read on the chart, or it can be a certain degree of vision as well can be defined as blindness. So you can have, again, 2020 vision in the middle and sometimes not even realize that you're losing some of the vision out there. So that's, again, why it's really important, especially if you have a diagnosis of glaucoma to get seen every few months, um, just monitor your pressure in case that needs an adjustment to the treatment, um, as well as to just kind of regularly see how well your peripheral vision is doing and if it's changing. Yeah, my last visit, uh, my pressure was 1313. Awesome. That's perfect. So yeah, we love it between 10 and 20. And then if you have a diagnosis of glaucoma, ideally even below 18 every visit. So 13 is a great pressure for the eyes. What is your recommendation to somebody who has glaucoma but has difficulty uh, getting seen by his ophthalmologist? Hmm. I mean, if you're having trouble with visits, um, laser is a great option if you can get that done because that can last up to several years. Um, and then you don't have to worry about the eye drops being prescribed or being able to get those from the pharmacy regularly. Um, there are outreach um, activities in some urban places like Philadelphia, as well as some cities in California where they will go around, do screenings. If you have glaucoma suspicion or glaucoma, they will do a laser on the spot because then even if you're lost um, to follow up, you have at least some treatment on board. So laser is a good option. Um, But if you're having trouble, again, I would say as long as you're seeing an ophthalmologist, not an optometrist, but an ophthalmologist who's gone to medical school, um, they should be able, any ophthalmologist should be able to manage uh, mild to moderate glaucoma. It's when it becomes the more severe glaucoma or possibly needing surgery that you definitely should see a glaucoma specialist. So just getting into even a comprehensive ophthalmologist, you should be able to get um, that kind of eye care for that level. Well, one of my colleagues has difficulty getting an appointment to see his eye doctor. So does he need to just change his eye doctor? Maybe that's possible. Yeah, so if there's an accessibility thing, um, any comprehensive ophthalmologist um, should be able to manage mild to moderate glaucoma. 
Well, it looks like we've exhausted all the questions and she's answered them so splendidly. Uh, and so we have to thank you so much for taking the time to educate us. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for having me, guys. It's been a pleasure. Okay. And thank you. Next week, we're going to have uh, Dr. Lou. Yeah.